But tonight, I've got head-to-head -head with a man who actually wants to deport me. Alex, suicide pill! Alex, mass murder pill! Okay, let me ask you one question. Without an overarching mission, you come up with a turkey. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the fifth episode of the first season of The Cab Show. Tonight, we have Everything Man 987 look into the most hotly debated defense topic today, the F-35. And a couple of things. If you are a creationist, conspiracy theorist, flanker, or fulcrum fanboy, Russian propaganda troll, or simply disagree with us, please feel free to contact our Skype. It'll be in the description below. If you found anything wrong with what we said, or spotted a mistake we made, please let us know in the comments below. We love constructive criticism and we'll look into it. Let's get started. I'm the Doge Knight. I'm Dalek14MC. I'm Storm Squad. I'm, I'm Everything Man 987 And I'm IBT98. Alright, Everything Man 987 you have the stage. Thank you. Now tonight's video will be about that very hot topic both on the internet and in the Pentagon running rings around the world today, and that subject is the notorious F-35 Lightning II, the Joint Strike Fighter. Over the past few years, the F-35 has constantly been on the receiving end of one main critic, Pierre Spray. And yes, we are very sorry we couldn't bring this episode to you earlier. There were some personal issues involved as well as some serious delays with scheduling. However, we do have it now, and we think you'll enjoy it very, very much. Of course, moving on, Spray does seem to have a weird fetish for calling aircraft he's displeased with turkey. Without an overarching mission, you come up with a turkey. You've called the F-35 a turkey. Absolutely. It is a turkey. It's inherently a terrible airplane. It's not good at anything. What about it's a, as a bomber? So, I will be solving the riddle. Who's the real turkey here? Now, this episode will be broken into two parts. In the first part, I will be explaining the history of the Joint Strike Fighter program and Pierre Spray, who he is and where he comes from. In the second part, I will be explaining why the F-35 is wrongly perceived as a turkey and proceeding to debunk Pierre Spray's claims. So, without further ado, here's the history of the F-35 and Pierre Spray. Spray was born in Nice, France, and raised in New York. He was educated at Yale University, where he studied aerospace engineering. He later went on to Cornell University, where he studied mathematical statistics and operations research. After that, he worked for the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and subsequently at Grumman as a consulting statistician. In the mid to late 1960s, Spray met John Boyd while they both worked on the FX project, the project which resulted in the F-15 Eagle. John Boyd was working in the Pentagon as a defense analyst and Air Force officer whom, with the help of mathematician Thomas P. Christie, developed the infamous, or famous, EM theory. EM theory is basically how aircraft use their airspeed or energy to maneuver in aerial combat to gain the advantage on the enemy. It's also a standard measure to see how aircraft can maneuver. EM theory is described in a simple equation, or P of S equals T minus D over W times V. P of S is your excess energy, which is used to turn. T is thrust. D stands for drug. W is weight. And V is your velocity, measured usually in knots, indicated airspeed. Anyways, I digress. Spray joined the Fighter Mafia, which was a group of analysts in the Pentagon who advocated for change in tactics and fighter design. Spray quickly earned a reputation as somewhat of an immature yet conceited analyst who, with even no military experience, asserted himself as an expert, someone who hated technology, and someone who despised any project he was not a part of. He claimed to have written the AX program that would later become the A-10 and worked on the F-15 with NASA. He lied on both accounts. Spray later went on to doubt the F-117 and M-1 Abrams before their combat debut in Operation Desert Storm in 1991. Both platforms proved him wrong and have a gleaming combat record to this day. Spray did some TV work in the early 2000s, appearing on a few documentaries talking about fighter aircraft on the Military Channel and the History Channel. He 
He's a vigilant critic of the F-35, claiming it's too fat to manoeuvre, too dangerous, too fast for CAS or close air support, too slow for air-to-air combat, too expensive, too behind schedule, not stealthy, limited in range, and many, many more. These days, Spray makes occasional visits to the Russian propaganda spewing pathetic excuse for a news organization called RT, and does nothing else than bitch and complain about how bad the F-35 is and how it will be cancelled after 500 planes built instead of the intended 2,500. Now moving on to the F-35, the F-35 is the result of the Joint Strike Fighter or JSF program, which aimed to create a tri-service aircraft as well as the Marine version for the Royal Navy. This program, however, started off as two separate ones. One program was known as a Common Affordable Lightweight Fighter, and the other was called Joint Advanced Strike Technology, or JAST. The former was a US Navy and Marine Corps project that started in 1993 with the goal of creating a low-cost, easy-to-handle V-stall fighter for the Marines, possibly Air Force and the Royal Navy. The latter was a joint United States Air Force and United States Navy initiative to create a brand new fighter capable of replacing the likes of the F-14, F-16, F-18, F-111 and others. Both of these projects merged around 1994 while still under the Joint Advanced Strike Technology or JAST name. The program office now started to accept design concepts for a fly-off, much like the ATF program that became the F-22A and the Lightweight Fighter program that resulted in both the F-16 and F-A-18. Two of the best designs would compete for a lucrative contract to build aircraft that would come in three variants. The variants were the A model, used for the US Air Force and other customers. The CTOL, or conventional takeoff and landing variant, would be the baseline aircraft, the cheapest and the lightest. Single engine, stealthy, jam-packed with the latest technology, long range, lots of weapons, and have the ability to perform both strike and fighter roles. The B model for the Royal Navy, Royal Air Force, and U.S. Marine Corps, this Stovall or short takeoff vertical landing variant would replace the F-A-18 and AV-8B in the Marines and Sea Harrier and Harrier II in the Royal Navy and Air Force. This aircraft needed the ability to hover in midair on pillars of thrust from its engine, yet retain the A model's level of agility, weapons payload, stealth, and electronics package. And lastly, the C model for the United States Navy. This aircraft had to be able to exercise Cato Bar ability or catapult-assisted takeoff but arrested landing. In layman's terms, it had to take off and land from United States Navy aircraft carriers. This version needed extra strong landing gear, folding wings, and a strong arresting hook with a strengthened airframe to withstand the abuse that carrier aircraft have to take. Yet, it still had to retain all the previously mentioned combat capabilities the Alpha and Bravo models had. The program was then cleared hot with those requirements set. Its name now changed to JSF or Joint Strike Fighter. McDonnell Douglas, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin and Boeing submitted their designs. And in 1996, the Pentagon announced the winners, Boeing and Lockheed Martin. Shortly after, the esteemed defense contractor, McDonnell Douglas, was absorbed into Boeing after encountering financial troubles. The two designs would be given X or experimental designations rather than the traditional YF or prototype fighter designations. This was because both companies would have to build the most challenging variant, the B or Stovall model. This meant that both aircraft had to be experimental planes that would prove the concept would even work in the first place. The Boeing design was given the name X-32 and the Lockheed one X-35. The Boeing design was conceived in its secretive Phantom Works and consisted of a large tailless delta configuration with a rather odd, massive gaping intake under the nose, similar to the F-16's design, only exaggerated. The X-32's lift system that Boeing thought would be the best solution for a Stovall strike fighter was called direct lift. Direct lift was simply a plumbing system under the engine, redirecting the hot gases expelled by the F-119 directly under the aircraft. However, the project ran into some severe issues. Midway through designing it, Boeing decided the Taylor's Delta configuration compromised the aircraft in too many ways, performance-wise, weight-wise, and on the radar screen. Boeing changed their configuration last minute to a more traditional four-poster tail, twin horizontal stabilizers, and twin vertical tails for their final design proposal. However, the two prototype X-32s would not incorporate the changes and had to fly with the tailless delta configuration. 
The X-32 used the same Pratt & Whitney F-119 engine found on the F-22 Raptor and had a top speed of 1.6 Mach. It was, in our opinion, horrible in every way. Sluggish to turn, with a relatively high wing loading, terrible kinematic performance, and no space for weapons. Not only did Lockheed beat the X-32 to its first supersonic flight and later first vertical takeoff, but when Boeing tested the X-32's vertical lift capabilities, they had to remove body parts and panels to save weight. That coupled with the inflexible design, which had to be changed over weight concerns midway through the project, prompted the Pentagon to start looking more into Lockheed's proposal. The Lockheed Martin design was designated X-35. It was a much more conventional design with a single engine, four poster tail and trapezoidal wings, somewhat resembling a smaller single-engine F-22 Raptor, which is also built by the same company, by the way. One curious aerodynamic feature on the X-35 was its DSI, or Divertless Supersonic Inlet. This design was not only more stealthy than a conventional intake, but its main advantage was the weight it saves. Basically, supersonic aircraft need a system of movable ramps or cones in the intake to slow supersonic air down. Supersonic air is bad for jet engines because of its low pressure. Of course, Bernoulli's principle states that faster air has a lower pressure, and the lower pressure air is once it enters a jet engine, the much harder it is to compress, making the aircraft's engine lose significant amounts of power. Because of this complicated system of bleed air valves, ramps, and cones, these systems can add thousands of pounds of weight to an aircraft. The shape of the DSI keeps the shock cone in front of the intake at supersonic speeds, enabling the trailing subsonic air to enter the engine. The lift system, Lockheed proposed, was bought from the Russian Yakolev Corporation, oddly enough. The Yakolev 141 was a Soviet-era VSTOL aircraft intended for the Navy. The aircraft used a swivel-down nozzle and two lifting jet engines in front of the flight engine. This system balanced the aircraft on three different columns of thrust. Lockheed bought the manufacturer and intellectual rights to the design in 1994 and worked with Yakolev and Rolls-Royce to improve it. The X-35 featured the same swiveling nozzle the Yak-141 had, which would use a three-bearing system to move the exhaust down at a 90-degree angle to push the jet in the air. At the front of the engine, the shaft from the spinning turbine was directed to a large vertically placed fan. The moving compressor blades the F-135 engine had would drive a vertical lift fan built by Rolls-Royce. This meant that the X-35 would balance on two columns of thrust, one hot from the engine and one cold from the lift fan. The cold lift fan would also block hot gases from entering the intakes of the F-35 and possibly stalling the engine. Two roll pulse nozzles bled air from the compressor stages of the engine to provide roll control as well. With both designs built, the JSF fly-off kicked off on September 18, 2000, when the Boeing X-32 took off from the Boeing factory in Palmdale and landed at Edwards Air Force Base. A little over a month later, the Lockheed X-35 flew from the Lockheed Fort Worth plant in Texas to Edwards Air Force Base on the 24th of October the same year. The next few months were dedicated to test flights and endless evaluation. The X-35 demonstrated its ability to refuel in mid-air, and, as mentioned earlier, beat the Boeing plane to its first VTOL and supersonic flight. After months and months of testing, the Pentagon announced the winner of the JSF fly-off on October 26, 2001. And to the surprise of absolutely no one, the X-35 won, and was selected to enter production as the F-35. The subsequent next five years were dedicated to designing the F-35 A, B and C. Lockheed Martin slightly enlarged its X-35 design into the F-35. The third fuselage is 5 inches or 130 millimeters longer to make room for avionics. Correspondingly, the horizontal stabilizers were moved 2 inches or 51 millimeters rearward to retain balance and control. The top surface of the fuselage was raised by 1 inch or 25 millimeters along the center line. Also, it was decided to increase the size of the F-35B Stovall's variant's weapons bay to be common with the other two variants. Manufacturing of parts for the first F-35 prototype airframe began in November of 2003. Because the X-35 did not have weapons bays, their addition to the F-35 would cause design changes which would lead to later weight problems. The F-35B Stovall variant was in danger of missing performance requirements in 2004 because it weighed too much. 
reportedly by 2,200 pounds or 1,000 kilograms, or 8%. In response, Lockheed Martin added engine thrust and thin airframe members, reduced the size of the common weapons bay and vertical stabilizers, rerouted some thrust from the roll post outlets to the main nozzle, and redesigned the wingmate joint, portions of the electrical system, and a portion of the aircraft immediately behind the cockpit. Most of the changes were applied to all three variants to maintain high levels of commonality. By September 2004, the weight reduction effort had succeeded, reducing the aircraft's design weight by 2,700 pounds or 1,200 kilograms. But the redesign cost $6.2 billion and delayed the project by 18 months. In the early design phase of the F-35, it's often quoted as being a nightmare, but that's very simple to explain. The first total program cost, weight and performance estimates were made way back in 2002, before the first prototypes had even ever been unveiled. This was way too early for any accurate predictions to be made. Because the F-35 is a joint American and British design, it was announced on June 7, 2006 that the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter would be named Lightning II. As a striking coincidence, both countries had famous forerunning fighters named Lightning. P-38 Lightning built by Lockheed and the British EE Lightning. English Electric would later become BAE Systems, which had a huge role in the development of the F-35's avionics. Northrop Grumman also had a huge part in F-35 development. It provides the AN-APG-81ASA radar and the AN-AAQ-37 Electro-Optical Distributed Aperture System, or DAS. The first of its kind, it utilizes six high-resolution infrared sensors strategically placed around the F-35, giving the aircraft a 360-degree unobstructed infrared view around the aircraft. This makes it possible to lock on and fire heat-seeking missiles at any target around the aircraft, or even track ballistic missiles up to 800 miles away. The F-35 features a full paddle with glass cockpit touchscreen, a panoramic cockpit display or PCD with dimensions of 20 by 8 inches or 50 by 20 centimeters, a cockpit speech recognition system or DVI direct voice input provided by Adacel has been adopted on the F-35 and the aircraft will be the first operational US fixed wing aircraft to employ the DVI system. Although similar systems had been used on the AV-8B Harrier II and trialed in previous aircraft such as the F-16 Vista, a helmet-mounted display system, or HMDS, will be fitted to all F-35 models. While some fighters have offered HMDS along with a heads-up display or HUD, this will be the first time in several decades that the front-line fighter will be used without a heads-up display. The F-35 is equipped with a right-hand HOTAS, or hands-on throttle and stick side-stick controller. The Martin Baker US-16E ejection seat is used in all F-35 variants. The US 16E seat design balances major performance requirements, including safe terrain clearance limits, pilot load limits, and pilot size. It uses a twin catapult system housed inside rails. The F-35 employs an oxygen system derived from the F-22s, which has been involved in multiple hypoxia incidents, but unlike the F-32, the, F the profile of the F-35 that it's supposed to fly is similar to other fighters that routinely use such systems. The Communications Navigation and Identification, or CNI suite, is designed by Northrop Grumman and includes the Multifunction Advanced Data Link, or MADL, as one of a half dozen different physical links. The F-35 will be the first fighter with sensor fusion that combines radio frequency and infrared tracking for continuous all-direction target detection and identification, which is shared via MADL to other platforms without compromising low observability. The non-encrypted Link 16 data link is also included for communication with legacy systems. The F-35 has been designed with a synergy between sensors as a specific requirement. The aircraft sensors being expected to provide a more cohesive picture of the battle space around it and may be available for use in any possible way and combination with one another. Much of the F-35 software is written in C and C++ due to programmer availability. ADA-83 code is also reused from the F-22. The Integrity DO-178B Real-Time Operating System, or RTOS, from Green Hill Software, runs on CTOS Freescale PowerPC processors. The final Block 3 software is planned to have 8.6 million lines of code. 
In 2010, Pentagon officials discovered that additional software may be needed. General Norton Schwartz has said that the software is the biggest factor and might delay the USAF's initial operational capability. In 2011, Michael Gilmore, director of operational and test evaluation, wrote that, quote, the F-35 mission system software development and test is tending towards familiar historical patterns of extended development, discovery and flight test, and deferrals to later increments, unquote. The F-35 does not need to be physically pointing at its target for its weapons to be successful. Sensors can track a target and nearby aircraft from any orientation, providing the information to the pilot through their helmet and therefore visible no matter which way the pilot is looking and provide the seeker head of a missile with sufficient information. Recent missile types provide a much greater ability to pursue a target regardless of the launch orientation called high off boresight or HOPS capability. Sensors can be used and combined with radio frequency and infrared or SAIRST to continuously track nearby aircraft while the pilot's helmet mounted display system displays and selects targets. A helmet system replaces the display suite mounted heads up display used in earlier legacy fighters. Each helmet costs approximately $400,000. F-35 systems provide the edge in Observe, Orient, Decide and Act or OODA loop, which is another John Boyd invention. Stealth and advanced sensors aid in operation while being difficult to observe. Automated target tracking helps in orientation. Sensor fusion simplifies decision making and the aircraft's control allows the pilot to keep their focus on targets rather than the controls of their aircraft. Meanwhile, General Electric and Rolls-Royce teamed up to make a second F-35 engine as a competitor to Pratt & Whitney's F-135. The goal was to drive down costs with the General Electric and Rolls-Royce team and Pratt & Whitney's engines competed for contracts. The F-136 had its first run on the 21st of July 2004, and in August of 2005, the DoD then awarded Rolls-Royce and General Electric a $2.4 billion contract for what was called SDD, or System Development and Demonstration, which was scheduled to run until September 2013. Unfortunately, in 2011, the DoD cancelled the F-136, citing costs and looking to reduce the program's financial troubles. The first pre-production F-35A was revealed to the public on the 19th of February 2006. The airframe designation AA-1 was unique, as all F-35As built afterwards would receive an AF-XX designation, making the first Lightning a one of a kind. Later in September that year, the first F-135 engine was run while mounted in the airframe, and on 15th of December 2006, the first major milestone in the F-35 program was achieved. It took off for its first flight with Lockheed Martin test pilot John Beasley at the controls. As AA-1 had no radar or tactical sensors on board, because its avionics bays were filled with testing equipment, Lockheed Martin modified a Boeing 737-300 with an AN-APG-81 AESA radar, as well as a fully functional F-35 cockpit to test the avionics later production models would have. The test vessel was named the Lockheed Martin Catbird. Oddly enough, the Catbird is still in use, testing upgrades and avionics made by Northrop Grumman, mainly Block 3 software. Later F-35 airframes AF-01 and AF-02 continued further testing of the flight characteristics of the F-35A. The first F-35B model, designated BF-01, which can make short takeoffs and vertical landings, was flown for the first time on the 11th of June 2008 this time by a British test pilot from BAE Systems, Gran Tomlinson. The actual stovall capabilities of the B variant commenced in 2010, and on March 17, 2010, the F-35B made its first hover, and the next day, on the 18th, it landed vertically for the first time. Not to rest on its laurels, the F-35B was pushed to its first supersonic flight by the 10th of June, and in January the next year, Cracks in the aluminium bulkhead of the F-35B were discovered during ground testing, prompting the company to restrict vertical takeoffs and landings and redesign the aircraft. However, as of August 2015, these problems have been rectified. By June of 2009, the program was behind schedule. However, many of the development targets have been met. During 2008, a 
Pentagon Joint Estimate Team, or JET, estimated that the program was two years behind public schedule. A revised estimate in 2009 predicted a 30-month delay. Delays reduced planned production numbers by 122 aircraft through 2015 to provide an additional $2.8 billion for development. Internal memos suggested that the official timeline would be extended by 13 months. Nearly 30% of test flights required more than routine maintenance to make the aircraft flightworthy again. As of March 2010, the F-35 program had used a million more man-hours than predicted. The U.S. Navy projected that life cycle costs over the 65-year fleet life for all American F-35s to be $442 billion higher than the U.S. Air Force projections. F-35 delays had led to a shortfall of up to 100 jet fighters in the Navy Marines, although measures had been taken using existing assets to manage and reduce the shortfall. The F-35C's maiden flight took place on the 7th of June 2010 at Naval Air Station Fort Worth JRB. A total of 11 U.S. Air Force F-35s arrived in fiscal year 2011. And on March 9, 2011, all F-35s were grounded after a dual generator failure and oil leak in flight. The cause of the incident was discovered to have been the result of faulty maintenance. In 2012, Navy Commander Eric Etz of the F-35 Program Office commented that rigorous testing of the F-35 sensors had taken place during Exercise Northern Edge 2011, and had served as a significant risk reduction step. Since then, F-35s have been involved in exercises with the Army and Marines, proving its survivability, surviving with no shootdowns in areas that the A-10, F-16, F-15, and F-18 had all been lost. On August 2, 2011, an F-35's integrated power package, or IPP failure, during a standard engine test at Edwards Air Force Base, led the F-35 to be immediately grounded for two weeks. On August 10th the same year, ground operations were reinstituted. Preliminary inquiries indicated that a control valve did not function properly, leading to the IPP failure. On the 18th of the same month, the flight ban was lifted for 18 of the 20 F-35s. Two aircraft remained grounded due to a lack of monitoring systems. The IPP suffered a second software-related incident in 2013. This resulted in no disruption, as a fleet was already grounded due to separate engine issues. The problem has since been resolved. On the 25th of October 2011, an F-35A reached its design top speed of Mach 1.6 for the first time. Further testing demonstrated Mach 1.61 and 9.9 Gs in a turn. On February 11, 2013, an F-35A completed its final test mission for clean wing flutter, reporting to be clear of flutter at speeds of up to 1.6 Mach. On August 15, 2012, an F-35B completed airborne engine start tests. And in, also in 2012, the F-35B completed high angle of attack testing, yielding extremely impressive results. The F-35A could hold angles of attack and sustain flight of up to 70 degrees in any altitude, even upside down, and a max angle of attack of 110 degrees. During testing in 2011, all eight landing tests of the F-35C failed to catch the arresting wire. This warranted a redesigned tailhook, and it was developed and delivered two years later in response. In October 2011, two F-35Bs conducted three weeks of initial sea trials aboard the USS Wasp. On the 6th of October 2012, the F-35A dropped its first bomb, followed three days later by an AIM-120 AMRAM launch. On the 28th of November the same year, an F-35C performed a total of 11 weapons releases, ejecting a GBU-31, JDAM, and GBU-12 paveway from its weapons bay in the first ground weapons ejections for the F-35C. On June 5th, 2013, an F-35A at the Point Magoo Sea test range completed the first in-flight missile launch of an AIM-120C Block 5 AAVI, or AMRAM Air Vehicle Instrumented. It was launched from the internal weapons bay. On November 16, 2012, the U.S. Marines received the first F-35B at Marine Corps Air Station Yuma, and VMFA AW-121 unit is to be redesignated from a Boeing F-A-18 Hornet squadron to an F-35B squadron. A February 2013 Time article revealed that Marine pilots were not allowed to perform a vertical landing. The maneuver is deemed too dangerous, and it's only reserved for Lockheed test pilots. But as of now, the test ban 
has been lifted and Marine Corps pilots are permitted to perform vertical takeoffs and landings. On the 10th of May 2013, the F-35V completed its first vertical takeoff test and on August 3rd the same year, the 500th vertical landing of an F-35 took place. Clearly, as the project was advancing along, the aircraft became more mature, easier to use, easier to maintain and easier to operate. On January 18, 2013, the F-35B was grounded after the failure of a fuel hydraulic line in the propulsion system two days prior. The F-35 does use fuel as hydraulic lines. The problem was traced to an improperly crimped fluid line manufactured by Stratoflex. The Pentagon cleared all 25 F-35B aircraft to resume test flights on the 12th of February later that year. On February 22, 2013, the DoD grounded the entire fleet of 51 F-35s after the discovery of a cracked turbine blade in a U.S. Air Force F-35A at Edwards Air Force Base. The grounding was lifted on the 28th after an investigation concluded that the cracks in that particular engine resulted from stressful testing, including excessive heat for a prolonged period during flight, and did not reflect a fleet-wide problem. The F-35C Lightning II carrier variant conducted its first carrier-based night flight operations aboard an aircraft carrier off the coast of San Diego on November 13, 2014. The aircraft completed all its flights way better than expected and didn't suffer a single mechanical or electrical problem. On the 5th of June 2015, the United States Air Education and Training Command Accident Investigation Board reported that a catastrophic engine failure that had led to the destruction of an Air Force F-35A assigned to the 58th Fighter Squadron, the Gorillas, at Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, on June 23rd the previous year in 2014, that the third stage forward integral arm of a rotor had fractured and broke free during the takeoff roll. Pieces cut through the engine's fan case, engine bay, internal fuel tank and hydraulic and fuel lines before leaving through the aircraft's upper fuselage. Leaked fuel and hydraulic fluid ignited the fire, which destroyed the rear two-thirds of the aircraft. The destruction of that particular airframe resulted in the cancellation of the F-35's international debut at the 2014 Farnborough Air Show in England and the temporary grounding of the F-35 fleet and ongoing restrictions in the flight envelope. Of course, since then, the problem has been fixed and the F-35 A and B have been at air shows. The F-35 A involved in the incident has been written off. However, the remaining front third of the airframe will have the surviving parts, such as the radar, reused and reintroduced to new production F-35s. On the 19th of June 2015, the Royal Air Force successfully launched two 500-pound Paveway 4 precision-guided bombs, making it the first time non-U.S. munitions were deployed by the aircraft. The U.S. Marines had declared the aircraft met IOC or initial operational capability on July 31, 2015, after successful testing aboard the USS Wasp. The F-35 is also set to include the MBDA Meteor long-range air-to-air missile in the future, as well as the AIM-132 ASRAM and the IRIS-T infrared missiles. The F-35 is also expected to be able to launch different types of weapons, such as nuclear B-61 nuclear bombs from its internal weapons bay. So, to sum it all up, the F-35 program started off roughly due to over and underestimations made by the DoD, early in the program, when there was absolutely no way of knowing what would happen in the future, or what types of situations and problems they would run into. As of the recording of this episode, the F-35 has suffered only one lost aircraft, which was written off, and no fatalities, making it one of the safest testing programs the United States has ever had in the history of military aviation. The F-35B is currently in service with the Marine Corps and in testing and training with the United States Air Force, Navy, Royal Air Force, Royal Navy, Royal Netherlands Air Force, and the Royal Australian Air Force. So far, Italy, Israel, South Korea, Japan, and Norway have all ordered the F-35. Israel is expected to customize their own F-35s, dubbed the F-35I, with their own indigenously developed systems. The F-35 has had some rough times. Of course it did. It's a brand new aircraft. But as of now, all major software bugs have been fixed. The engine problem has been fixed. Mechanical issues have been rectified, and the F-35 has stellar performance in climate testing, 
high level of attack testing, carrying and sea trials, and close air support exercises. As of now, over 150 have been built, with the price dropping with every LRIP, or low-rate initial production batch of aircraft coming off of Lockheed's plant. The program has been going uphill for some time now and is expected to get its Block 3i software in 2017, enabling it to fire its advanced 25mm gun. The U.S. Air Force is set to achieve IOC, or initial operational capability, next year, and the Navy by 2018. Now that we know the hit-and-miss history of the F-35 program, we are going to take a look at Pierre Spray's claims made in various news interviews. Pierre Spray has long been a critic of the F-35, asserting himself as the designer of the F-16 and the A-10. Mr. Spray, you helped design both the A-10 and the F-16. Now, do you think they can both be replaced by the F-35? For Pierre Spray, one of the designers of the old F-16, its victory over the new fighter comes as no surprise. Owing money at the wrong aircraft at the wrong time and for the wrong reasons, the creator of the old F-16 fighter says there are a number of planes that outclass the new jet. When you have an airplane that has too little wing, has too much drag, too much weight. Well, let's pick that claim apart first. Pierre Spray worked at the Pentagon as a defense analyst. What does a defense analyst do? Well, they do just what the job title says. Defense analysts are responsible for observing defense-related intelligence. It would be through studies made by one of the five uniformed services. It could be through satellite or spy photos of enemy equipment. Or it could just be watching a demonstration of an enemy weapon at an air show or some type of event. They take this information, and through what they've observed, they synthesize a conclusion, which is passed over to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and other defense officials for consideration. Defense analysts are also responsible for writing down requirements for a new defense contract. For example, let's say in a hypothetical situation, the Navy is falling behind in its ability to operate off beaches and in shallow water policing waters for pirates. A team of Pentagon analysts would then go ahead and write down the requirements for a new type of patrol boat. It had to be able to go this far on a tank of gas, have X amount of armor, and then needs to operate in waters that are shallow up to Y feet deep, and so on. Then the requirements are passed on to defense contractors who design and built the prototypes to meet and exceed the requirements set by the analysts. The Pentagon, if pleased, will then proceed to procure a contract with the company and start purchasing these new shallow water ships for the Navy. Pierre Spray was a defense analyst, not a designer. He may very well have worked on the lightweight fighter and AX programs that resulted in the F-16 and A-10, but never designed a single nut or bolt on either aircraft. He simply helped set the requirements on which each aircraft was designed for. General Dynamics and Fairchild Republic engineers are responsible for the design of the F-16 and A-10, and Spray never worked for either company, and therefore never had any design influence. An easier way to find how much of a charlatan Spray is, is to look at the TV work he did in the 2000s on the then Military Channel and History Channel. His occupation credentials are listed only as Defense Analyst. Funny, how only after the F-35 program really kicked off and went into the public eye, Spray became a fighter designer all of a sudden. And remember, his credentials didn't say F-16 designer, A-10 designer, or even aircraft designer or aircraft engineer. Now, for the interview where I think Spray gives the most amount of his talking points about the F-35. It has to be his 10 minutes of sunshine with the Canadian broadcast channel or CBC's The Fifth Estate. I'll skip the parts of his interview that don't really make any sense and don't really contain any arguments, like his first couple seconds or so rambling on bureaucracy. The F-35 was born of an exceptionally dumb kind of piece of Air Force PR spin. The, the mission of the airplane was to be half of what the Air Force called the high-low mix was supposed to be one super expensive, supposedly super capable fighter, the F-22, and then a cheaper fighter of which you were supposed to be able to buy a lot that would do everything else. 
that was beyond the air to air, and that was the F-35. That whole high-low mix idea was an Air Force PR concoction to make up an excuse. This was actually from the 70s. Can you believe this? It shows you how long dumb ideas persist. Okay, here we get to his first argument, the F-35 being the result of the dumb idea of a high and low mix of aircraft. And you know what? He's right. The high-low mix of aircraft was in the 1970s, but that's all he's right about. I find it funny because Spray's favorite aircraft of all time, the F-16, was actually the result of the same dumb idea. The F-16 was designed as the low aircraft in the high-low mix of the F-15 and F-16. Many people say the F-16 was designed with the philosophy, quote, not a pound for air to ground, unquote. Yet this statement is also false. The F-15 was much more expensive, bigger, and better at air-to-air, especially at beyond visual range. The F-16 did not even have a radar when it was a prototype, and only had limited radar capability when it first went into service. That saying, not a pound for air to ground, was only pertaining to the F-15, and the F-15 only. Little do people know, the F-16A blocks 1 through 15 were actually designed with an air-to-ground mode built into the throttle, and activated by a single switch as part of the hands-on throttle and stick or HOTAS configuration. From the get-go, the F-16 was designed as a multi-role fighter. It was designed to drop bombs while the F-15 went out and shot down enemy aircraft. A design philosophy our little bowling friend here claims was dumb. Now, what other nonsensical rhetoric is he going to spout out next? It was... In the 70s, the Air Force, the apple of its eye, was the F-15. Oh, wow, speak of the devil, the F-15. Now let's see what he has to say about it. A two-engine, great big fighter for its day, close to 50,000 pounds, super big radar, all the bells and whistles that the Air Force could think of, uh, which was exactly what they wanted, big, expensive airplane. Uh, Colonel Boyd and I and Colonel Riccioni had worked on it, had gotten disgusted with it. Whoa there, Pops. Colonel Boyd and I had gotten disgusting with it. Wow, big words coming from an intellectual midget. Colonel John Boyd was a fighter pilot. He served in Korea. He never got any kills, but after the war, he went to the top fighter pilot school in the States, the Fighter Weapons School. There he developed the OODA Loop, a conversation for another time, and taught fighting tactics to younger officers. While there, he got the nickname... 42nd boy. That was because he would go on to his younger pilots and tell them to start flying at his six o'clock. If after 40 seconds they were still there, he would pay them victory money. Nobody ever beat him, of course. And I'm guessing that fierce nickname didn't sit well with the ladies, but moving on, Boyd later teamed up with mathematician Thomas P. Christie to develop a mathematical model to try and explain why he was such a damn good pilot. This is where they came up with the EM theory, more formally known as the Energy Maneuverability Theory. After Boyd had developed his theory, he worked on the F-15 project, or FX project at the time, as a mathematical analyst. After his work on the FX and lightweight fighter programs, he retired and started giving lectures, and here is where I hit the nail on the head. Boyd passed away on March 20th, 1997. By then, the F-15 had already seen five model versions, the A, the B, the C, the D, and the E. It had already participated in the 1982 Lebanon War and constant Israeli-Syrian skirmishes and the Gulf War in 1991. Even after all these wars and upgrades where Spray claims Boyd and him were disgusted by the Eagle, Boyd still gave taped lectures, all of which praised the F-15. In fact, if you could find a single quote of Boyd saying how he was disgusted by the F-15, please give us a link down below. That would be game-changing. One more thing about the F-15. Over 70% of its kills, which it has 104 of them, were made beyond visual range. An engagement envelope, which wouldn't be possible without all the junk fitted to the F-15. In fact, the F-15's last kill on record was made in the 1999 Operation Allied Force in the former Yugoslavia SSR beyond visual range at night. A feat impossible without all the junk. 
because it had gotten too loaded up with junk. And so we went off and as kind of bureaucratic guerrillas, an underground started the F-16. Now here Spray goes on to give a whitewashed version of history about the F-16 program that isn't actually true. The lightweight fighter program actually had its roots in the late 1960s, before the F-15 even flew, or even had a chance to be supposedly fitted with all the junk. Which was going to be less than half the size, half the cost, and much hotter. It was going to just wax the F-15. Wax the F-15? Are you serious? Maybe in visual range at low altitudes with a better pilot, but the F-15 not only has a much larger and much more advanced radar, which means it can hypothetically detect and kill an F-16 before it can even see the F-15, but above 40,000 feet, the F-15 actually has a better sustained turn rate than the F-16 because the F-15 has two engines, which means more air can be pushed to sustain a higher airspeed and larger stabilizers, giving the F-15 better pitch authority in the thin air at that altitude. I would know this. My father was an actual F-16 pilot in the Israeli Air Force. By virtue of being smaller and hotter and designed specifically for that mission and not designed to carry a bunch of junk, mm -hmm. a bunch of complex electronic stuff that had no relevance to combat. Like I said before, all this electronic junk has made the F-15 the single most successful air-to-air -air fighter ever made. I wonder what world Mr. Spray really lives in. I mean, no relevance to combat, the F-15 would have 70% less kills than it does now if it weren't for all that junk. You've called the F-35 a turkey. Absolutely. It is a turkey. It's inherently a terrible airplane. Here we go again with the turkey shit. I mean, really, Spray, you have to stop calling everything you don't like a turkey. You're a grown man and not a child on a playground. Because it's an airplane built for a dumb idea. As soon as you go to design a multi-mission airplane, you're sunk. This argument is horrible beyond horrible and easily refutable. Ever heard of the F-A-18 Hornet? It was designed as a half-ground attack aircraft and a half-fighter aircraft, and look at it now. It scored two MiG-21 kills in the 1991 Gulf War with four 2,000-pound bombs under each aircraft's wings. The Hornets then proceeded to complete their bombing run after the engagement. Ever heard of the Eurofighter Typhoon? Panavia Tornado? F-15E Strike Eagle? F-16 Falcon? All of which were designed either as multi-role aircraft or had ground attack capability added on afterwards. The bottom line is this. Multi-mission aircraft are not only more efficient than many single-mission aircraft, but more cost-effective and safer. Look back at the U.S. Navy arsenal in, let's say, 1968. They had the F-4, F-8... A1, A4, A5, A6, A7, and a lot more that I left out. Now look at the U.S. Navy arsenal today. FA-18 Legacy Hornet, which is the C&D, FA-18 Super Hornet, ENF, and the EA-18G. That's it. Having less aircraft to do more not only saves space on carriers and saves cost, but allows an aircraft on an attack run to defend itself against enemy fighters, jam enemy radar, and support troops. Pilot training has also been taken into consideration as well. If you train a pilot for a single mission and want to move him to another aircraft, you have to spend more money and time to retrain him. With today's technology and training methods, a single pilot can move from one aircraft to another seamlessly and still know how to make an effective BFM engagement, jam enemy systems, drop bombs with pinpoint accuracy, make a strafing run or two, and go home all in one day. As soon as you try to make the airplane do close support, air-to-air, uh, -air, deep interdiction bombing, and to carry a whole long laundry list of technologies as long as my arm, you're sunk. You'll never get a good airplane out of that. You'll get a kludge, you know, that will fail, you know, time and time again. And even worse, it's a three-service airplane which means now you have three bureaucracies squabbling over the specifications. That's not true. Having one aircraft and three services doesn't necessarily compromise its performance. You have the Air Force, the Marines, and the Navy, and each of them wants something totally different. Mm -hmm. And then you have the pretense that somehow you can fold all this into one airframe, air, air 
and make it work mm -hmm. for three different services. What's happened is you've compromised the airplane horribly for three different missions. That's not true. The only difference between all three versions of the F-35 is the way they take off and land. The B version is supposed to take off and land in short distances or even vertically if necessary. The A version is supposed to take off from regular runways and the F-35C is supposed to take off and land on aircraft carriers. That's the only difference. Other than that, the F-35 replaces the F-16, the A-10, the AV-8B, the F-A-18, ABCD, and a lot of the F-15E's combat capabilities. This saves a lot of money. Imagine one squadron of F-35s versus multiple squadrons of F-15s, F-16s, F-18s, A-10s, and AV-8Bs. The aircraft is actually designed to do, well, just a few couple things. The first is air-to-air -air if needed, meaning it could engage and kill targets at long range or, if necessary, at short range. The second is close air support which means supporting troops on the ground by dropping guided munitions. And the third is deep strike interdiction, meaning it could either strike against enemy air defense systems in the seed roll or suppression of enemy air defenses as a wild weasel, or it can fly really low, really fast into an area and drop a devastating payload. And you've compromised it even worse for three different services. You know, so just as an example, mm -hmm. the Marines have this, you know, mindless uh, uh, passion now, recently, for vertical takeoff airplanes. The Marines don't have a mindless passion. That's a blatant misrepresentation of the facts. The Marines are a designated naval fighting force. They are naval power projection, or to put it simply, the Sea Army. In their own words... All of their resources are dedicated to that one 19-year-old grunt on the ground. Everything in the Marines supports their infantry in one way or another. This means all their aircraft are used primarily for close support, ground attack, and bombing. This includes the AV-8B Harrier II they use today. Because the Marines are a first response force that deploys into a war quickly until the army gets there, they sometimes have to operate out of makeshift bases and runways. The Harrier gave the Marines the capability to use extremely short strips of land as runways for close support aircraft. Just look at the 1991 Gulf War. The AV-8B provided Marines with excellent close support, operating from a Saudi football stadium and its surrounding roads. General Norman Schwarzkopf, who led the coalition forces during the Gulf War, named the Harrier as one of the seven crucial weapons of that war. Ever since they got the British Harrier, well, that makes the airplane very fat because you have to have a lift fan in the center of the airplane to blow air vertically, to make it take off vertically or land vertically. Uh, so now you have a great big fat center section. Now you have too much drag. Oh, here we go with the frontal surface area argument. Oh, no, the F-35 is too fat. Well... I'm sorry, but that is just a fabricated lie made out of pure ignorance. If you look at the frontal surface area of the F-35, it's no larger than an F-A-18E Super Hornet, a Eurofighter Typhoon, or a Dassault Rafale, all of which have less thrust and less range than the F-35, and carry less weapons. In addition to that, the F-35's frontal surface area is the size it is because of its internal weapons base, not its lift fan. That's what dictates the size. The fact that it has to carry two 2,000-pound bombs and two AMRAMs in its weapons base make it, uh, quote-unquote, fat. In fact, the F-35's predecessor, the X-35, was designed as a sea tall aircraft first, then modified on the drawing board to contain the lift fan. So the F-35's frontal surface area is a result of its weapons storage capability, not the single B version's lift fan. It turned out they put on tiny wings, which helps it to take off vertically, but means it can't maneuver in combat. You know, you need wings to create lift to turn. No wing, no turn. And so the airplane is astonishingly unmaneuverable. The tiny wings argument is actually partially true. Uh, he did use it in the military channel top 10 fighters on the AV-8B Harrier, but 
that we're not talking about right now. It's only partially true, though. Spray is right about lift. Lift is used to turn an aircraft. The more lift available used to turn, the better. The F-35's wings are designed as low drag, low weight, yet strong and high lift devices. But that doesn't mean the aircraft has a high wing loading and can't turn. Because the wings alone have a lift loading of 107.7 pounds per foot squared, that is only taking the F-35's wing area and dividing it by the aircraft's gross weight. And here's the reason why that's kind of BS. Back in the late 1960s, the Martin Marietta Aircraft Corporation experimented in cooperation with NASA to develop lifting body aircraft to help design possible future space shuttle-like vehicles for re-entry. The aircraft tested the viability of using a smartly shaped body to produce enough lift from its body to make it able to fly comfortably on its own. Martin Marietta built the X-24A and the X-24B. What they found was that both aircraft were able to achieve speeds in excess of 1,000 miles per hour or 1,609.34 kilometers an hour. That was because the aircraft managed to produce a high amount of body lift for relatively little drag. The F-15, F-16, F-A-18 and F-22 all use lifting body designs as a low drag, high lift alternative to the F-14, SU-27 and MiG-29's body designs. See our episode on Daylight 14 MC's channel for that. The first one, F-15 versus SU-27 comparison maneuverability. Martin Marietta later merged with Lockheed in 1995 to become the Lockheed Martin Corporation, the aircraft design company that makes the F-35. And the lifting body knowledge, even though it was already there and done by Lockheed as presented on the F-22, was absorbed into the new company. The F-35 uses the same design philosophy as the X-24. You can see the frontal fuselage even resembles that of the X-24. Its body produces an estimated 40 to 45 percent of the total F-35's lift. That's because of a lifting body design, of course, and its nose chines. The chines on the nose of the F-35 act as vortex lift generators. And here we go with vortex lift. Vortex lift is the result of vortices generated by highly swept edges of either delta wings, chines, or lurks, leading edge root extensions, at higher angles of attack. Vortices are produced from these highly swept edges and proceed to arc over the aircraft's wings. This yields two major advantages. The first advantage is the vortex arc actually suppresses boundary layer flow separation on the top airflow of a wing, preventing it from stalling at increased angles of attack and increasing its pitch capability and ability to hold high alpha maneuvers. The second advantage is it increases lift while moving the center of pressure over the wing forwards slightly. This is because anyone with a basic understanding of fluid dynamics, which is aerodynamics and hydrodynamics, will know that the vortexes create suction due to their low pressure, and the suction on the top of the wing is lift. The vortices also tend to arc over the wing forward of the center of lift. This moves the center of lift, well, forwards, decreasing static stability and increasing pitch rate. During a turn, which is basically a sideways high AOA and constant pitch, the vortex effect is compounded, and the F-35 has three different vortex generating devices per wing. The first one is the nose-mounted stealth-friendly chine, which not only reduces radar cross-section, but of course provides vortex lift for the wing. The second is the sharply swept chine on the intake, which is coming off the front of the DSI intakes all the way onto the wing. And the third is a small lurx or leading edge root extension off the wing itself. Each vortex generator is spaced apart widely from one another in order to keep airflow clean and to make sure that none of the vortices overlap and cause buffeting and a net loss of lift. In the last episode of the History Channel's Dogfights, Dogfights of the Future, British F-35 test pilot Willie Hackett is quoted as saying the F-35 has a very low wing loading. It is a swing roll aeroplane in the sense that it can do both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground at the same time. It was designed to be that from the outset. Uh, it's got a lot of thrust. It's got a very low wing loading. 
Uh, it's very easy to flag. This directly contradicts Spray's claim of a high wing loading. And as far as I know, Spray never flew the F-35 or even has access to its classified information. Of course, if he does, uh, and you can prove it, please let us know. The one disadvantage these vortices bring is drag, but the F-35's engine is powerful enough to compensate for that drag and some, but we'll get to that later. Looking into Spray's logic, we see the major problem. Let's look at the F-106 Delta Dagger. Massive, fast, very fast in climbing, can carry lots of weapons, but not very maneuverable compared to fourth generation fighters. It has a wing loading of 52 pounds per foot squared. That's actually really low. That's due to its large delta wing and relatively low weight for its size. The F-15C, on the other hand, which is the most successful fourth generation fighter of all time, with 104 air-to-air kills to no losses, is one of the most maneuverable fighters on the planet. And its wing loading is 73.1 pounds per foot squared. Uh Uh-oh, the F-106 has a far lower wing loading than the F-15. Does this mean the F-106 will be flying circles around the F-15? A fucking course not. I know this doesn't take into account thrust-to-weight ratio or the fact that delta-wing aircraft bleed energy faster, but the F-35 has a pretty high thrust-to-weight ratio in interceptor configuration and has large stabilators and clean airflow, allowing it great pitch authority, especially at higher altitudes. There is a huge wing-loading difference between the two aircraft, the F-15 and the F-106, and one would think that this would at least constitute a little bit of a difference in maneuverability. But here's why the F-15 is so much more maneuverable than the F-106. The F-15's quoted wing loading leaves out all the lift produced by its body. And how do we know that the F-15's body produced lift? Well, this was clearly demonstrated in the 1983 Negev Israeli Air Force mid-air collision, where an A-4 Skyhawk, which was engaged in a mock basic fighter maneuver engagement with an F-15B, collided and ripped the starboard wing of the F-15 off. In most other occasions, which have actually happened before, in training, aircraft losing a wing spiral out of control and the pilot either needs to eject or die in the crash. But this F-15B kept flying and actually landed safely with one wing. McDonnell Douglas and the Israeli Air Force proceeded to do a study on this incident and came to the conclusion that the F-15's lifting body design compensated for the loss of an entire wing. And remember, the F-15 doesn't even produce as much lift as an F-35 does, even though the F-35 is smaller. This is due to advancements in computer-aided design or CAD and CFD, computational fuel dynamics design, as well as a better understanding of lifting bodies. This means the F-35 produces more body lift per square foot. So, What about Pierre Spray's little hot rod, his baby, the F-16? Well, let's compare the F-16 to an aircraft he absolutely loathes, the F-4 Phantom II. The F-4E Phantom II has a wing loading of 78 pounds per foot squared. The F-16, the greatest fighter to ever exist in Spray's words, has a wing loading of 88.3 pounds per foot squared. Wow, that's a lot. By Spray's own logic, once again, the Phantom must trump the F-16 in a dogfight. But again, it fails to see the big picture. The F-15 has a lifting body design that the Phantom lacks and lurks, leading edge route extensions that allow the F-16 to easily turn inside a Phantom's radius and outmaneuver it in any flight envelope. In fact, An F-16 training and introduction video from the late 1970s shows how tight the F-16 really turns compared to an F-4 Phantom. Now, Spray's claim, as I said, is partially true, but the F-35's wing loading doesn't take into account all the rest of the body lift it makes. And overall, as Willie Hackett said, taking into account these lifting surfaces and the vortex generators, the F-35 indeed has a low wing loading. No, because it has to carry 108 pounds of airplane per square foot of wing. So in air-to-air combat, in dogfights. In dogfighting, it's hopeless. 
is it now? The F-35 is projected to have a similar instantaneous and sustained turn rate as an F-16 and a similar pitch rate to the Super Hornet. It's been tested to almost 10 G, and as I've said before, it has a large amount of lift for relatively little drag. How do we know it has little drag? Well, let's take a look at the F-35's speed. The F-35 wasn't even designed to supercruise. That wasn't taken into account when Lockheed Martin was creating the design. How do we know the F-35 has little drag? Well, let's take a look at its speed capability. The F-35 is quoted as being able to supercruise for a couple hundred miles at Mach 1.2. Here's the catch. The F-35 wasn't even designed to supercruise. The F-35, when it was still on the drawing board, it wasn't even taken into consideration if it could supercruise or not because the designers weren't really bothered with it. This has happened before on other low-drag aircraft. Coincidentally, by the English Electric Lightning, the F-35's forerunner from the 60s. The EE Lightning has such a low frontal cross-section and such little drag that even though it has a relatively low thrust-to-weight ratio compared to today's aircraft, it's so sleek and aerodynamically slippery, it can supercruise. And Spray, for a fact, has never seen the F-35 maneuver unrestricted in its envelope. That's because it's classified information. And before you go on saying, oh, so how could you know that the F-35 is maneuverable? Well, test pilot statements, as well as basic deduction, drew me to that conclusion. So no, the aircraft is not astonishingly unmaneuverable. You can guarantee that a, a, a 1950s designed MiG-21 or French Mirage uh, would just hopelessly whip the uh, mm -hmm. the F-35. Okay, I'm not even going to address this one because it's not worth my time, and I did previously explain why the F-35 is maneuverable. So if the F-35 is not a fine combat uh, plane, what about uh, as uh, support for troops, air support? That's the most laughable of all, because to support troops you have to be able to get in close, to maneuver, to find really difficult to find camouflage targets. You have to be able to turn at quite slow speed. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to carry a large gun, say like the A-10. Uh, and you have to be able to stay in the vicinity of the troops for four to six hours. You have to be able to loiter in order to really give them all day cover when they need it. And, and this the is hopelessly impossible with the F-35. Why? The F-35 uses far too much gas. It's lucky if it can hang around for an hour or an hour and a half at most. Oh, please tell me how you know how it could only hang around for an hour or an hour and a half at most. I mean, you don't know that. But great. He's talking about CAS or close air support now. And let's look at some facts here. First off, Spray claims you have to be able to get in close and low to find difficult to find camouflage targets. Well, in the daytime, the A-10 only has visual reference. If a target is well camouflaged enough, it wouldn't matter if you were in a helicopter a couple feet away from it and hovering, you still wouldn't see it. The F-35 uses ultra-high resolution radar ground mapping and thermal imaging systems that can pick out body heat of camouflaged soldiers or the heat signature given off by fighting vehicles any day or night in any weather. The F-35 uses guided weapons. It can carry the AGM-65 Maverick missile, guided bombs, cluster bombs, and many more. Because it carries guided weapons, it can actually fly at high altitudes safely away from the combat zone and employ these weapons with pinpoint accuracy. We see that today in Afghanistan and Iraq against attacks against ISIL. FA-18 Hornets, F-15E Strike Eagles, and F-16s actually perform the majority of CAS missions. The A-10 is being phased out because it's not really needed, and it's wearing out really, really fast. Production ended in 1984, and spare parts haven't been built for over 20 years. In fact, the original manufacturer of the A-10, Fairchild Republic, went out of business in 2003. 
Now, the A-10, on the other hand, can employ guided weapons, but it can't do it safely. Because of how slow and low it flies, it's vulnerable to surface-to-air missiles. It also has a huge radar cross-section, or RCS. This enables surface-to-air missiles to easily detect it and fire. And modern surface-to-air missiles like the S-300 and later the S-400 travel at such high speeds the A-10 might not have time to react. You also need really, really advanced jamming equipment to counter this threat. The A-10's vulnerability to -to surface-to-air missiles was demonstrated in the 1991 Gulf War. In the 1991 Gulf War, Desert Storm, the A-10 only flew a fraction of the missions the F-16 did. Both aircraft did low-level bombing missions and close air support. In those missions, the F-16 only suffered three combat losses. The A-10 suffered twice that, six, yet they flew less missions. And even in the 1991 Gulf War, which is now 24 years ago, the A-10's primary weapon used in that war was the AGM-65 Maverick, which can also be fired from the F-35, no problem. That being said, the F-35 also has its 360-degree infrared capability. It can see around the aircraft 360 degrees unobstructed at very high resolution, as demonstrated by a journalist visiting Lockheed Martin and seeing an F-35 flying over Edwards Air Force Base looking into a hotel room in the Las Vegas Strip a couple miles away. Because of this, the F-35 can comfortably fly at high altitudes, undetected because of its stealth, which we will get to later, and yet employ guided weapons that can hit with pinpoint accuracy, saving troops. And as for loitering for one hour, back to that again, uh, there's a thing called mid-air refueling, Pierre Spray. You know, it's been around since uh, the 1950s. You, You know that, right? Moving on. The F-35 is also stated by Spray in other interviews to be vulnerable because it has a single engine surrounded by fuel. Well, right now the United States is testing out a new system called OBIGS, or Onboard Inert Gas Generating System. This system produces inert halogen gases like hydrogen, helium, neon, xenon, and war, to be fired into the gas tanks of an F-35 in case a fire starts. And the single engine of the F-35 was designed to be as reliable as possible. This is because of the Navy version and their concern with using a single engine aircraft. And of course, this isn't the 1960s anymore. Single engine aircraft are quite reliable. The F-16 is very reliable and in fact in the last 10 years has suffered less accidents than the F-15, a twin-engine aircraft, has in the United States, at least. Along with the onboard inert gas generating system, as I stated earlier, the F-35 is a lifting body design. It can have a wing shot off and still make it back to base. The A-10 is basically a popsicle stick with the engines mounted on the outside and wings. That means if one wing is shot off, an unstable lift coefficient will be achieved, and the aircraft will roll out of control and crash. Also, the F-35 has a multiple, multiple redundant fly-by-wire system. Fly-by-wire systems are known to be more reliable and safer to use in combat than conventional mechanical systems like the one employed on the A-10. Fly-by-wire uses flight control computers to control the aircraft, and the F-35 system is so smart, it can repair itself by rerouting through different wires in different parts of the airframe and fuselage if some are damaged. This also means that it doesn't bleed hydraulic fluid because of a new advancement in flight control systems. This is a closed-circuit hydraulic system, meaning if one small servo is short out, it won't bleed out hydraulic fluid like a regular conventional hydraulic system used on the A-10 and F-16. This means you can shoot out entire areas of the aircraft and the others will still have enough hydraulic fluid to keep it flying and fly it back to base safely. The maneuverability is laughable. You know, you couldn't possibly get down 
in the weeds, as the pilots say, with this airplane. Oh yes, you can. The F-35 has an angle of attack ability of 70 degrees in sustained flight. This means the aircraft can fly at really low, really slow speeds. Its stall speed is also incredibly low. So yes, it can fly low, slow, and maneuver sharply, even though it won't because, well, there's no reason for it to do that. And turn in time to see a tank. You know, remember, a tank is not visible from even maybe from a quarter mile or less. Mm -hmm. This airplane, at the speeds at which it has to go, because of the tiny wings. Remember, it can't maneuver, so it can't fly slow. Well, that's already been addressed. And yes, the F-35 can see a tank way more than a quarter mile away. In fact, you can see it up to 50 miles away due to its electro-optical targeting system mounted in the nose. Nor should it in combat because it's so vulnerable. So what is it good at? It's not good at anything. What about it's a, as a bomber? It's a terrible bomber. So it's a terrible bomber, and by the way, because of stealth, it's designed really to carry the weapons internally, right? You can't hang weapons under the wing and still be invisible to radar. So the whole thing, that's another thing, by the way, that makes it fatter and, mm -hmm. and more drag. Okay, addressing this situation, yes, the F-35 is designed to carry its weapons internally, but it has room for three hard points per wing plus one centerline hardpoint to carry more munitions, and one factoring the individual load stress factor of each hardpoint, the F-35 can theoretically carry a payload of well over 23,000 pounds. That's a lot of bombs. In fact, the A-10 can only carry 16,000 pounds. Hmm. So the F-35 can actually carry the empty weight of an F-16 under its wings, yet still maintain a lower radar signature than the A-10. And even if you mount the weapons externally, it will still have a lower radar cross-section than fourth-generation fighters, which not only have to mount weapons externally anyway, but aren't designed with stealth features that the F-35 has. And... Has he ever heard of the F-117? The F-117 not only had a smaller payload than the F-35, but it has a stellar combat record. In the 1991 Gulf War, during Operation Desert Storm, the F-117 flew a fraction of the amount of sorties of coalition aircraft, yet 40% of the important strategic targets in the Gulf War, command and control centers, air bases, centers of operation, intelligence centers were all targets of the F-117. Again, more fuel consumption and less maneuverable. So you can put two big bombs inside this thing. Two big bombs can do more than enough damage. The F-35 can carry multiple 500-pound bombs in each bay or a single one-ton bomb. Now proven in recent conflicts against ISIL and the Iraq War and Afghanistan and Operation Allied Force and Desert Storm in 1991, two 2,000-pound bombs carried by F-16, F-18, F-15E or F-17 can have devastating effect because they can find their target within centimeters. This means you don't have to carpet bomb an entire area just to hit a single strategic target. You know, which is a ridiculous payload for most conventional war. Again, it can carry theoretically over 23,000 pounds of munitions, quoted 17,000 pounds, which is not a ridiculous payload. And most conventional wars today fought against a state opponent with an integrated air defense system would spell doom for any non-stealthy aircraft, especially the A-10, and the F-16. In modern combat, you need an entire force of suppression of enemy air defense or seed wild weasel aircraft specially equipped to go after SAMs and destroy them before a strike package can enter the area. With the F-35, a few F-35s can slip through the radar gaps in the defense system, blow up the target, and subsequently blow up the surface-to-air missile sites. So, well, talk to me then about the, the stealth. I mean, how, how stealth capable is the F-35? Well, the first thing to know about stealth is that it's a scam. You know, 
it simply doesn't work. You know, radars that were built in 1942 could detect every stealth airplane in the world today. The Battle of Britain radars, not because there was anything great about them, but because they happened to have very long wavelength. So every Battle of Britain radar would see the F-35 and the F-22 and the B-2. You know? Now, I'm not talking here as an antiquarian because unfortunately the Russians picked up on this and have been building exactly those radars ever since World War II. They never stopped building low frequency, long wavelength radars. Mm -hmm. And they've modernized them to an extraordinary extent. They build some really amazing mobile versions of them now that are both hard to find when they're camouflaged and can be erected in 40 minutes and see every stealth airplane in the world. And they sell them to anybody who's got cash. Oh, that was a bunch of blatant lies. If stealth is a scam, then why are most countries today, including China, Russia, Japan, Turkey, and South Korea, rushing to develop stealth aircraft? Stealth is not a scam. That's an outright lie. Russian radars wouldn't be able to pick up stealth aircraft because of the amount of clutter low-frequency radar detects. In fact, low-frequency radars have such a low resolution, they can't even be used for targeting and flying at fast speeds will easily confuse them. Low-frequency radars have a massive design trade-off, and they're very easy to detect, damn, and destroy. And here's why. Low-frequency radars have, as Mr. Spray said, very long wavelengths. This means that the TR, or transmitter-receiver modules, have to be in accordance with the size of the wavelength in order to receive and transmit them. This means that low-frequency radars are, well, they're absolutely massive. In fact, they're a couple stories high. They're the size of buildings, and there's nothing mobile about them. There's no such thing as a mobile low-frequency radar, another blatant lie. This means that they are very easy to detect from long ranges, and in fact, are very easy to jam and confuse and subsequently destroy with an anti-radiation missile. And because of low-frequency radars, low-resolution, they cannot be used for search and destroy. They cannot track aircraft and fire and guide a missile to them. This is not possible with low frequency radars unless you have one the size of a small city with enough transmitter receiver modules to paint an accurate picture of what's going on in the sky. And also, if these Russian radars can pick up any stealth aircraft today or any aircraft today, then What's the point of building any new aircraft in the first place? I mean, the F-16, your favorite fighter, must be toast, according to you. So, so you're telling me it's a bad airplane, it, it can't do dogfights, it can't protect troops on the ground, it's a lousy bomber, and despite everything that the manufacturer is saying, it's, it's not stealth. Correct. So what is you the are point exactly of the, correct. So what is the point of this plane? The point is to spend money. That is the mission of the airplane, is for the U.S. Congress to send money to Lockheed. That's the real mission of the airplane. This is nothing but a giant conspiracy. He's talking about lobbyists and how people are bought off and what not. The simple thing is, DARPA, which reviewed the program, said the F-35 is the correct plane for the United States to buy. And are you seriously telling me that all the generals and all the defense analysts, all the designers and producers of the F-35 and the U.S. Air Force, Navy and Marine Corps, the Royal Air Force and Navy, the Royal Australian Air Force, the Royal Netherlands Air Force, the Italian Air Force and Navy, the Israeli Air Force, the Republic of Korea Air Force and the Japanese Self-Defense Air Force all bought an aircraft to protect their airspace and their sovereignty that was meant to spend money? Okay. If you say so. And I guarantee you, by the time all the failings of the F-35 have come to light, you know, if Canada is still buying it, they'll be paying $200 million plus. $200 million plus. Plus. Because among other things, of course, the quantity, the promised quantity, will never happen. Right. You know, nations will drop out. Lots of people won't have the money to pay for it, both abroad. And the U.S. is going to cut back, keep on cutting back the buy. As the buy cuts back the cost will go up and up. 
I'm, I'm predicting that in the U.S. we'll probably never buy more than 500 airplanes. Now, I understand that this interview is over three years old, but since Mr. Spray is making predictions here, let's see if they came true or not. First of all, the F-35A's price is projected by Lockheed Martin and the Pentagon to be about $83 million per plane plus the engine when it enters FRIP or full rate initial production in 2018. To put that into perspective, an FA-18 Super Hornet costs about $75 million per plane and doesn't have the range, stealth, or avionics the F-35 has. If you mount the capabilities an F-35 has on an FA-18, like an infrared search and track system, electro-optical targeting system, distributed aperture system, advanced AESA radar, and other classified systems, you'll have yourself an $85 million aircraft. Look at the Boeing FA-18E International Roadmap Package and Advanced Super Hornet. And in fact, the F-35A today already costs less than a Eurofighter Typhoon, FGR-4, Dassault Rafale, and F-22. Also, since then, nations haven't dropped out of it. Of course, Canada has always been sort of that loose cannon in the F-35 procurement, but two more nations have signed on to the F-35, and in fact, Australia, the Netherlands, and Italy have already either taken delivery or are awaiting short delivery of their F-35s. Israel, South Korea, and Japan have since signed on. And, as of November 2014, 115 F-35s have already been built, so that they'll cancel it before 500 planes claim is already starting to vanish. And the US and other countries and services buying the F-35 haven't actually cut back a single order yet. That means the cost of the F-35 in the US will shoot up beyond 300 million, maybe 350 million. If there had been a real competition in 2010 before uh, Canada made its decision, how do you think the F-35 would have held up? If it was a straight-up competition mm -hmm. with, with reasonably well-defined mission goals and so on, I suspect one of the European fighters would have won. Not that they're very good. You know, just they're not as bad as the F-35. Well, of course, that's just your speculation based on your own preconceived notions that the F-35 is an inherently terrible aircraft and, well, a turkey. Well, uh, the Gripen or the Eurofighter or whatever. The Gripen or the Eurofighter both have less range, no stealth, and less weapons capability than the F-35. Each of them don't have the electro-optical distributed aperture system, which allows a 360-degree infrared view around the aircraft, and have to individually carry a separate targeting pod instead of the F-35's fully integrated internally mounted one. Also, they have less advanced radars with less detection range and less resolution. Also, they have to carry separate jamming equipment. The F-35 has all of these things, in one plane. Uh, as they have won in other countries. Really? The Gripen and the Typhoon have won over the F-35 in other countries? I'm sorry, that's just a blatant lie and a misrepresentation of the facts. The F-35 has never entered a single fly-off competition with any other competitive aircraft. The Eurofighter and Gripen deals made so far in other countries were made without the F-35 even considered as a competitor as it was still in flight testing in the United States at those times. Where they have had competitions, uh, I think it would be hands down that, they, that the F-35 would lose on a whole bunch of grounds, on cost grounds, on reliability grounds, on performance grounds, on all of it. Again, the Eurofighter Typhoon and Dassault Rafale cost more than the F-35. And I'm not going to get into the debate of the F-35 versus the Rafale or the F-35 versus the Typhoon. That's for another day. And, but the hooker would be that the people who are doing the evaluation or doing the competition have to understand about stealth and the fact 
that it's a very shaky business, that it's a scam. One of the, the reasons that uh, the Department of Defense has given for why it has sole sourced this uh, was because it was the only fifth generation uh, available, plane available. Well, first of all, fifth generation is another silly, you know, mindless cliche. It doesn't mean anything. Fifth generation means nothing, really. To my knowledge, fifth generation means supercruise, stealth, advanced networking over broadband data links, which are encrypted, as well as highly advanced sensors, all of which the F-35 has in spades. Of course they use stealth as the excuse for sole source. You know, without evaluating at all the question of does stealth work, you know, what are people likely to do who are facing stealth airplanes? What did the Yugoslavs do? How did the Yugoslavs shoot down the F-117? First off, it wasn't the Yugoslavs that shot down the F-117, it was the Serbs. Yugoslavia had already fractured into different states at that time. And second, the F-117 shot down in Serbia, flew the same route for its attack missions weeks and weeks and weeks before. The exact same route. Therefore, the Serbs already knew where and when to look for the F-117, and, of course, it was there right when they expected it. To compound the problem, the aircraft opened its bomb bay doors on its bombing run. When that happened, it gave away the F-117's position. And finally, the F-117, back then, had no radar warning equipment on board to warn the pilot of his impending shootdown. The feat has since never been replicated because NATO has changed the faulty tactics employed that night and the circumstances were so impossibly perfect for a shootdown of the F-117. Now, decades in the making, already the most expensive military project in history and still America's F-35 fighter jet isn't ready. Some are now pointing to signs that the plane's appeal is wearing off despite the efforts of its manufacturer. If the appeal is wearing off, please tell me why South Korea, Japan and Israel selected it as the next generation fighter. This multi-mission stealth aircraft is supersonic, radar evading and has unmatched counter-air, strike and ISR mission capabilities. Unmatched then, or so they say, but it does turn out that that's not actually the case because according to the results of a leaked US Air Force test, this supposedly state-of-the-art jet has been uh, beaten in a mock battle by a 40-year-old fighter, America's very own F-16. The test pilot of the humiliated prototype says the jet is a failure at fighting other aircraft because it simply doesn't have enough power. This is a report based off the War is Boring article made by David Axe. David Axe has a history of irrationally claiming the F-35 is a piece of trash. Not only is the name of the test pilot not stated or given, but the article is rather vague on what actually happened. The airframe used in this test, airframe F-35 AF-02, is not fitted with all the systems that make the F-35 a fifth-generation fighter. This includes the RAM radar absorbent material coating, radar, advanced sensors, and other systems. The airframe also uses outdated equipment, like the Gen 1 helmet, which was used from 2006 to 2011. It has since been replaced with the Gen 2 helmet, which is smaller, lighter, easier to maneuver around the cockpit of the F-35, and has more capability. Airframe AF-02 also lacked radar, or most of its avionics that other production model F-35s had. Why? Because it's a test aircraft, it is fitted with test equipment. AF-02 was the first F-35 to pull 9G, but that was only in a very highly set test in ideal conditions. Since the airframe AF-02 uses outdated flight control software, which limits the F-35 to 6 positive G so it can't even pull its maximum amount of G. Other than that, airframe AF-02 also doesn't have engine improvements later F-35 models have. The F-16 in question in this test was only used as a visual reference point for the F-35 to maneuver against. This was not a mock dogfight. If it was, Lockheed Martin would have acknowledged it, but in fact, they stated the exact opposite. It was just a visual reference test to see how the F-35 maneuvers and help develop tactics the F-35 can use to its advantage over other fourth-generation fighters. 
the F-16 was also supposedly carrying two wing tanks. Now, you have to take into account the fact that the F-35 carries more than three times the internal fuel capacity of the F-16. This means even with two external tanks, the F-35 can still carry more fuel. This report also directly contradicts test pilot statements made earlier about the F-35, saying with a similar weapons load at combat load, an F-35 easily outmaneuvers the F-16 and outaccelerates and outclimbs it too. This is what actual F-35 test pilots have stated. It's not even the first such embarrassment either for the F-35. A similar one, a single one, can cost nearly $120 million to produce. That is just not true. Then again, what on RT is? Which is a lot more than the jets uh, supposed than it, the jet it is supposed to replace, but it can't even match their performance either. Plus, the F-35 has already seen a series of technical failures. Those technical failures have since been solved. For Pierre Spray, one of the designers of the old F-16, its victory over the new fighter comes as no surprise. He wasn't a designer of the F-16. That was already covered. This airplane will, can basically be beaten by any modern fighter in the world. This test was a test of its ability as an air-to-air -air fighter. No, it was not a test of its ability of an air-to-air -air fighter. It was just to develop tactics and increase the F-35's maneuvering envelope. It was not a dogfight. It also has two other missions for bombing and for close support. It can do a lot more than that, including electronic jamming and suppression of enemy air defences, but that's not really important now, is it? Which it also doesn't do well at all. It doesn't do well at all. Well, the Marines have tested the F-35A at 29 palms and F-35B, and in ground tests doing close air support missions, the F-35 has never been shot down yet. In the same situation, the AV-8B Harrier and A-10 that exercises at 29 palms has been shot down. Please tell me again how bad the F-35 is at close air support. The F-35 is too heavy. Too heavy? The weight's been going down. The engine is not big enough for the weight. The engine is not enough for the weight. It's the most powerful fighter engine ever developed. And the F-35 at fighter configuration has a thrust to weight ratio well over one. In fact, the engine has been tested to well over 50,000 pounds of thrust. And by the way, the weight is going up. The weight is not going up. I don't know where he got this from, but the aircraft weight has actually gone down since 2006. The wing is too small to allow it to maneuver. We already addressed many of these topics. It's extremely important for a fighter to have a very ample wing. When these airplanes arrive in combat, there'll be a terrific danger to their pilots. Well, we'll see. I mean, I hope the day never comes when these planes' beautiful machines have to be used in combat, but if it does come, well, we'll see who's right here. The fact of the matter is, Pierre Spray is the real turkey here. He's a defense analyst from the 1970s, and I've got to give credit where credit is due. If this was the 1970s, this would be a brilliant analysis of the F-35, but it's not the 1970s anymore. In the 1970s, we didn't know what stealth really was. In the 1970s, we had no idea what a winglet was. We had no idea how to make a propeller go supersonic. Nowadays, they're fitted to C-130s. Back then, lifting bodies were not a popular concept. So, yes, for the 1970s, this would be a brilliant analysis, but times have moved on since then. And this is 2015. And soon enough, the F-35 will be in service and will show Pierre Spray. He is the real turkey. Join us next time on the Coalition Against Bullshit, where in Episode 6, Dalek 14MC will complete Part 2 on his series, Black Tail Defense Refuted. I'm the Doge Knight. I'm Dalek 14MC. I'm Storm Squad. I'm Everything Man 987. And I'm IBT 98. I would like to thank Dragon029 for helping in this episode. 
Although he didn't actually physically help in the production of this episode, he did provide the links and a lot of information on the F-35. We will link his Reddit page and his YouTube channel in the description below. So, thanks Dragon029, you were a lifesaver. I'd like to dedicate this episode to a retired pilot who lost his life, but not his wings. As he once told me, people who don't support the F-35 are people who don't understand military aviation.